Welcome to Fish Lake Bible Church on the Sunday morning. We are glad you're all here. For those who don't know, this is the fifth Sunday of the month, which means it is Family Sunday, so you'll notice. We've got all sorts of ages in here with us today, so um, we're excited about that. Excited to be with you this morning to worship. If you would stand with us as we begin our worship this morning, singing our song of the month, Firm Foundation. Good morning. Do you believe it? Amen. Do you believe it? Amen. All right. Pray with me. Father, thank you for your mercy. Father, whether we believe it or not, you will not fail. You have promised that you who have started a good work in us will see to it that you finish it. So, Father, we wait for the day that you finish it. Lord, I ask that we would, as we come to your feet this morning, 
we would not only be reminded of the gospel because we are forgetful people, but we would walk away today further settled in our hearts that you are who you say you are, and we can have the hope that we need to get us through every single day that you give us. So Lord, whether it's today, whether it's tomorrow that you come back, we wait. And we ask that you give us the faith to wait, the faith to stand firm, the faith to focus our eyes on what matters most, and that is Christ crucified, risen again, and one day returning to take what is rightfully his. So Lord, we ask that you fill us up with joy, that you fill us up with encouragement, that you fill us up with hope that far outlasts our current circumstances, knowing that you're going to fix it. And so we trust you in your name. Amen. Well, good morning. You may be seated. Uh, my name is Matt. I'm one of the pastors here. If you're visiting with us, thank you for joining us. Uh, if you got a bulletin on the inner page, on the third page, there should be a slot where you can fill out some information. You can drop that into the offering plate as it comes by. Let us know that you visited. We'd love to, uh, to follow up with you, talk to you, and um, get to know you more. So just a few announcements for you. We do have a lot going on around the church. I try and highlight some of the things every single week. If you are questioning or wondering uh, what else is going on, look in the bulletin. We have all the announcements there. You can look on our Facebook page. We have the announcements there every week on Monday or Tuesday. And then an email gets sent out as well. We're working on some other options to uh, make sure everybody gets communicated with. But the first one we do want to mention is our kids Christmas program. That is coming up here in about six weeks, November 17th. Uh, there are a few more slots available if you wanted to sign up your kiddo to be a part of that ki uh, Christmas play. Uh, they are not speaking portions, so that, that should take a little bit of the pressure off. But uh, And then we do have our first afternoon practice next Sunday after the AM service. Lunch will be provided for the kids who are there. Uh, and for you parents as well, okay? Uh, just to give you an update on this evening, same old, same old, but it's still going to be exciting. The dock is at 5.30. Olympians and Gophers are at 5.30 this evening. Both are going to be here at the church. And then we have Wave Runners this Wednesday at 7 p.m. for those parents who have kiddos but want to come to prayer meeting. We have that option available for you as well. Lagos Conference is coming up November 3rd through the 4th. November 2nd is a pre-conference day, so if you wanted to get a little bit more of the word for the conference, you can go on that day. Uh, make sure you register at colonvillechurch.org, or you can ask Pastor Stover if you have any other questions. And then our women's retreat, which we'll talk more about here in just a minute, but briefly, it's $25. It's coming up here November 18th and the 19th, 17th through the 18th. Thank you, sorry, 17th through the 18th. I don't know why I put that in orange, because I can't see it. Um, 17th through the 18th, it's $25. That includes three meals over the two days, and then Karina Hale will be speaking. Uh, the ladies have asked that you sign up by November 11th so they can have a, a good head count. And then, of course, our Fall Festival, which seems to have a new name every single week, but uh, it's the same gist, Fall Festival, November 19th from 4 to 7, that is here. It's going to be in the place of an evening service. Pastor Stover will give a devotional, but we're going to do a chili cook-off uh, for anyone who is not in Olympians. You guys can take part in that, uh, but then we'll have games, food, bounce houses, hay rides, and more. And that was it. Uh, so I'm going to hand it over to Miss Kathy. She's going to talk about the women's conference a little bit more, and then we'll greet each other. Do you guys have the video? Ladies, I'm so excited to be with you in just a few weeks for our Satisfied Conference. Uh, Psalm 9012 says, Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Circumstances, busyness, discontent, and worldly influences, they can all weigh on us, making it clear that the source of our satisfaction is often sought out outside of Christ. I'm so excited to get back to the basics with you in just a few weeks and be reminded of the deep satisfaction that we will find in Christ as we pursue our God-given roles as women. I love you all, and I'll see you soon. Karina grew up in our church. For you that do not know her, she is uh, our niece. She lives in Florida. Um, she is a mother of seven. Um, I'm sorry, six. <laughs> Sometimes there's extras. Anyway, she's a mother of six. Um, and she has, uh, she attended Word of Life BI for two years, I think, and that's where she met Kurt, her husband, and they have lived in Florida uh, for most of their married life. Um, but she loves the Lord, and she has gone through many, many, many up, up and downs, 
Um, and she would like to share that story with us, especially on Friday night. So she will be sharing her testimony on Friday night. And then Saturday, we'll, we will go on and do um, what she wants to talk to us about as far as being satisfied. Ladies, please come. This is a great time of fellowship. We're going to have fun. We're going to do crafts. We're going to eat together. We're going to get to know each other. Um, it's just a very special time, and I hate for anybody to miss it. Uh, if you can only come for part of it, let me know, and we'll work out the price as far as that. Also, as far as daycare, we would love to help you ladies who cannot um, get anyone to help you with the kids, but we need to know how many we're dealing with. So if you could put by your name when you sign up if there's a need for daycare um, and how many and how old they are, we'd really appreciate it. Also, um, if you can only come for part, please just come and talk to me and we will work that out. I just really, really encourage everyone to come. We're going to have a great time. And, and um, it's, it's good for us as women to get away and just lean on God and, and have some time where we can just be intimate in our relationship with him and evaluate where, we're, where we are at spiritually, but also become closer to each other. Thank you. Awesome. Like I said, a lot going on. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask myself. Uh, ask Pastor Stover. I'll be happy to talk to you and answer any questions you have. But at this time, why don't we stand together and uh, tell each other hi, shake a hand, hug a neck, uh, whatever you want to do. As you find your seats, I'm going to ask that you remain standing. Please remain standing as we continue in worship this morning, singing together the Re Reformation hymn. morning as a focus of our worship today 
as we focus on Christ and he alone is the source of our salvation. Let's sing together. The Lord is our salvation. for 
And that we can sit here this morning as, though, as those who do not lack hope. We do not lack hope in our Savior this morning because our Savior has said, I will come back for what is rightfully mine. And what is rightfully His, if you are in the Lord Jesus Christ today, you are rightfully His. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now is the time where we'll take up our offering. Uh, as I say every week, I will say it every single week, this is not the part of the service where we ask you for money. The Lord is the one who provides. This is just an extension of our opportunity to worship the Lord by giving as he has given to us. And so give as the Lord leads you, but pray with me. Father, we are so thankful that on that final day, as Revelation 19 says, when the sky splits open and Jesus, you come back riding on a white horse with the armies of heaven following behind you to wage the final war, Lord, you do not lose that battle. You have not lost a single battle. And so, Lord, I ask that we would have hope this morning, that we would look to that day, that we would wait for that day, that we would eagerly wait for that day. And while we wait, Lord, we thank you for the gifts that you've given us, the provision that you've given us. Lord, you provided everything that we need, spiritually, physically, everything. Lord, you are a God who sees and you are a God who provides. And so as we see you, as we worship you, may this offering be an extension of our worship to you as you have given to us. In your name, amen. Amen. Please stand with us. Continue in worship this morning in Christ alone.
be seated. This time we have a special number by the children. In my wrestling, in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Whoa, you are the peace in my troubled sea. In the silence, you won't let go. In the questions, your truth will hold. Your great love will lead me you are the peace in my troubled sea. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness, I will follow you. Oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse, I will trust the promise, you will carry me safe to shore. Thank you, Junior Church and the leaders and anybody else who are singing. Thank all of you. <laughs> uh, grace and peace to you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today we will be not in Luke. Today we will be in Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. Because, who knows what October 31st is? There it is. Reformation Day. If you don't know what Reformation Day is, it is simply this. It is the day in which Martin Luther, in the year 1517, on October 31st, nailed his 95 theses statements against the church doors of Wittenberg, protesting 
what the Roman Catholic Church was doing. It is simply from the Reformation, it is rooted in God's Word that we have the five solas, the five alones. Side note, Martin Luther, John Huss, Zwingli, Calvin, they did not start the Reformation. The Word of the Lord entered into his church, his bride, and said, this is not how it's to be. The Word of the Lord is the Reformation. The Word of the Lord reforms who we are. Each and every day we're supposed to be reforming more into the image of Christ. His Word alone has done this. The texts chosen today, Romans 5, 6 through 11, are going to be pointing to the alones. We know of the gospel through Scripture alone. Yes, we know of God as our creator from the earth around us. It is his creation. But we know about the gospel. You can't walk into that cornfield and grab an ear of corn and put your ear to it and hear that you are a sinner and that you need the Christ. His word alone illuminates the heart and mind to the things of God, who he is and who we need, and that is his son, Jesus Christ. We are saved by grace alone, by faith alone, through Jesus Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. This text speaks on all of those things. Emphatically, most importantly, this text speaks on the condition of man before a holy God without Christ. This text speaks on behalf of your Savior and His blood shed for you. The question that I'm going to keep repeating and asking, and as it is Family Sunday, I am going to be moving around a lot, because I normally do, and also we've got younger generations in here that need a little action with words behind it. As Christians, don't we need a little action uh, with our words as well? So, come with me into a hospital room to where you find yourself in a hospital bed. And you know that you're going there because your spouse or a loved one, who do you love most on this earth? Whoever just popped into your head, they're in the bed next to you with the curtain drawn. As you're laying there, you get hooked up because you need to draw blood because they need it to live, and you're the only one that can provide it. You're happy to. This is your loved one. You get hooked up, and the blood starts to drain, and the doctor comes up, and they say, it's worse than we realized. They don't need some of your blood. Your loved one needs all of your blood, and that means that you will have to give your life. Will you give it for the one that you love dearly? That person that popped into your head, will you give it? Yes. Yes. And then that curtain in between you and your loved one gets pulled. That's not your loved one. That's a stranger. Oh, uh, excuse me, Doc, you hooked me up with the wrong person. I don't know this person. I don't love him like I love this other one. Uh, is this still the same? Yes, it's still the same. Will you still continue to give your blood? Will you do it? Or how about that curtain gets pulled and it is your greatest enemy? This person that you know hates you with every fiber of their being will speak against you any chance that they get. Your blood trickles through. The machine has started. Will you unplug? Will you say, no, no way. They, they, no, I'm not doing it for them. They're getting everything that they deserve. Praise be to God, our Father in heaven, who did not stop there at they're going to get what they deserve, but instead through the blood of his Son, who gave it all, said, forgive them, they know not what they do. Jesus came to save the sinner, to save and die for his enemy. Praise be to God that we can trust in Christ alone. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word as it brings us closer and closer to you. As it brings us closer and closer face to face with the cross of your Son. To some, it is folly. To even lesser still, 
It is salvation. As we dive into your text, may you open our eyes, may you open our hearts, melt and move with the Holy Spirit to bring about a a further understanding and remembrance that we couldn't earn it, we don't deserve it. But you poured out your Son's blood so that our cup overflows. And as this text will point out, may we not be a people, may we not be your bride who fights amongst ourselves, but may we remember the blood that was given for us so that we can walk past these doors. We can walk over ourselves to go out and preach the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And may you be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. First, we're going to read the text, and then we're going to do like we normally do, and we're going to break it down. Romans 5, verses 6 through 11. For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. In this writing, Paul is directing this allegory, this point of remembrance, of reminding them of the gospel. He's reminding a certain specific group of people. The Christians in Rome. You have the Jewish Christians or Messianic Jews, and you have the Gentile Christians who are not Jewish of any sorts. They are fighting. It must blow us away to hear of a local body that does not agree with one another. They were fighting over two things. Amidst emperor worship, amidst false religions, polytheism, the Roman gods, Gnosticism, or the god of education and higher understanding and learning. Amidst all of that, the ones who are supposed to be unified are fighting with one another. You have the Messianic Jews that say, Jesus and... You need Jesus and you need to still follow the law to a T. You need to be circumcised. You need to look like us, talk like us, sound like us, smell like us. Then you have on the other side the Gentiles, the ones who don't know of the traditions and the law, that also say on this end, just Jesus. Hmm. Don't give me theology, just give me Jesus. Don't give me doctrine, just give me Jesus. All I got to know is that Jesus loves me and I get to do whatever I want. I'm never going to have to pay for it because grace is going to cover all my sin. Should we go on sinning so that grace may abound? By no means. These two have forgotten. They have not remembered that they are supposed to be unified in the bride. Do you think that Jesus Christ knows what his bride should look like? Real talk, real quick, if anybody comes to me and says, hey, Pastor Stover, love ya, um, I think Beth could look a little different. <laughs> I think she should wear this. I think she should do this. I think she should sound like this. I think, I think, let me stop you right there. I know my wife. I love my bride. I am going to let you know how my bride is to be. Jesus Christ is reminding all of us on this day who we ought to be. Not in disunion, not in lack of fellowship, but to be reminded of the unity we have through the cross of Jesus Christ. And Paul is going to appeal to the recipients of this letter with an allegory. A, what would you do? A pointed attack at the human, because we all know as soon as I said that curtain was pulled and it was an enemy sitting in the bed, I heard this noise. Uh Uh-oh. 
Christ is the example, we are not. He is going to display exactly what his love is. A love that is foreign to us, O oh man, O oh woman, to die for his enemies. Where did our salvation come from? And who does our salvation belong to? Romans 5, 6 through 7. Here we go. 6. For while we were, stop right there. I love that word. Were. I pray that this morning that you can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and you can hear the message of salvation and you can look back to who you were. If you say no to the cross, if you say no to the gift of salvation, there is no were. You still are under condemnation in the sin of bondage that you have created for yourself. You see, we all have a relationship with God. Believer and unbeliever, everybody has a relationship with God. You're either in Adam or you are in Christ. In Adam there is death. In Christ there is life. I hope today you can think about you were and who you are today because of Jesus Christ. For while we were still weak, weak, without strength, asthenis, asthenis, you cannot lift your pinky. Talking to the Jewish Christians, the Messianic Christians, a lot of their law about rest is that you were not able to lift anything that you couldn't simply lift with your tiny finger. Regarding salvation, you can't move a muscle. You got nothing to lift. You can't even put your hand up to lift your finger to boast in yourself before a holy God because you are not holy. You are without strength. God makes that known where our strength ought to be and where it should not rest. In Psalm 33, Psalm 33, verses 13 through 17, the word of the Lord says this, The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all of the children of man from where he sits enthroned, for he is the king. He looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. The king, lowercase k, the king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation, and by its great might, it cannot rescue. You are not saved by your own authority. You are not saved by your power. You are not saved in your arms. You are not saved in your strength. You are saved by God alone, through Christ alone, by grace alone, and faith alone. You are utterly helpless. You are not enough, and that's okay. Bless you. At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. At the right time. I hear countless discussions and arguments about, well, what's God waiting for? Or why did he do this so early? Or why was he late doing this? At the right time, by his will, by his power, by his grace, by his sovereignty, <laughs> he does everything at the right time. His declarative will, if he says it, it's going to happen. If he has said it and it has happened, it has happened. When? At the right time. At the perfect time, Christ died for the ungodly. That ungodly is us. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person. Though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. Took a while with this part because righteous and good, righteous and good, aren't those the same thing? No, they are not the same thing. This inflection on the word righteous in verse 7, these are the righteous people that, well, they got money, they got power, they got land, they got authority, they got all this stuff, and now this trouble is happening to them. <laughs> They're righteous. They can take care of themselves. Why don't they save themselves with all their money? You, do you think Elon Musk is going to be able to buy his way out of six feet of dirt? No. The great equalizer of man is six feet of dirt. 
Do not trust in anything else. If you hang your salvation and assurance of salvation on anything other than the Christ and Christ crucified, then it is a short stop and a sudden drop. Your life, your assurance, your salvation hangs with the one who was hung on a tree. He died for you. He is risen. We are risen with him to walk in newness of life. And with these two groups, with these two groups of people, they were not brought to life to stand in newness of life, just to step on their brothers and sisters around them. But we don't do that now, do we? We don't have our traditions over here and our lack of tradition over here. We don't, we're not, we don't do that. We shouldn't do it and we mustn't do it. So when these people look out and you will scarcely die for a righteous person, what's the difference between a good person and a righteous person? The righteous one is the one that should be able to save themselves. They got enough money and power and they don't need anybody else. They don't need any help, so they get what they deserve. The good person is the guy over here that'll give you the shirt off his back. He will fix your car. He'll be to every meeting. He's a good guy. You don't know whether or not he knows the Lord, but he's a good dude. You like him. You might, you might die for him. You might even dare to do it. But God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Question for you. You might scarcely die. You might dare to die for righteous and good. Would you jump in front of a bullet if it was meant for Biden? Why not? Well, because my standard says they're not good. I don't like them. They disagree with me. They're not like me. You know how long I lived? You know how long I lived in opposition of God? Not a single day. I was dead. I hated God. I wanted nothing to do with him. And he showed his love for me that while I hated him, he didn't need that curtain to be pulled to figure out who was sitting on the other side in that bed. He formed me in the womb. He knew everything about me. And despite that, he still said, take it all. God shows his love for us. He demonstrates it. This demonstration comes from God because he loves in word and he loves in deed. 1 John 3.18 commands us, let us not love in word, neither with the tongue, but in deed, in truth. Paul is arguing here with his demonstration of God that God is not absent in his words. If he says it, he's going to do it. He's going to complete it. He knew the plan. He knew who was sitting in that other bed. And he did it anyway. One may die for the righteous. One might die for the good. One might do this. One might do that. God has done it. God has sent his son. God did pour out his wrath on his son and it pleased him. Do you remember what you were, and why you are not that anymore. What were the people of that day demonstrating? Why did this letter need to be written? Were they demonstrating unity in the gospel? Are we demonstrating that today? <clears throat> what gain is it for us? to look at those around us from up here to down there, to boast in ourselves. The goal, brothers and sisters, is not to be right. Because in that realm of Jesus and, and just Jesus, nothing else, we can do what we want, they were both wrong. Because they started focusing on themselves more than focusing on the cross of the Christ. Remembering what they once were can you imagine the old man is dead, the new man has come, and you shackle that corpse of the old man to your leg and you drag that dead weight with you the rest of the way? Insanity. 
The old man is dead. Let him die. You are made in newness of life. Look at others with the same lens that God looked at you when he saw his son on the cross. Thanks be to God when you are before him. If you trust in him as Savior, he doesn't see Tim anymore. Praise be to God. He sees the shed blood of his son. How can I look at any of you <coughs> through the lens of Tim? It must be through the blood of Christ. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Do you remember who you are saved from? Who runs hell? Some people really quick to say, oh, the devil. I saw that on a TV show. God created hell for a purpose. God runs hell. You are saved from the wrath of God that you, you have accrued for yourself, heaped upon yourself, not because the devil made you do it, but because you wanted it. Hear, to, hear, hear it from a pastor. Sin is difficult to stay away from because sin feels good. If it didn't feel good, it wouldn't be hard to step away from you. You wouldn't be tempted. I'm not tempted by a plate of broccoli. I'm not. You put a pizza in front of me, though. My wife says I need to eat better. You are saved. You're saved from yourself. That old dead man. God sent his son to take his wrath for you. He took the penalty that we have earned for ourselves. It takes blood. It takes blood to have a relationship with God. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. Will you spill it on that day, or has Christ already spilled it for you? If he spilled it for you, amen and hallelujah. Rejoice in that. With that comes assurance of peace. Assurance of peace. You have assurance in salvation, yes. God will never leave you nor forsake you. You are always in his hand. He will never let you go. Now here on earth, our assurance, our peace can get rattled when we're not walking with the Lord. The Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians, all this infighting, why did Paul even have to write a letter? Essentially, all of this, do you remember, if you remember that God loved you even though you were his enemy and he died for you, stop with all this petty fighting. It's not worth it. If you walk not in the way, think, yeah, I have Jesus, but I'm going to systematically choose not him in all that I do, your peace is going to be rattled. You are going to be anxious. You are going to be worried. Am I actually saved? Am I actually? Your assurance gets rattled. Take heart. He who started a work in you will finish it and seek to the finish of his good will. You are his. And he might have to smack you around a little bit to wake you up. Praise be to God that he's willing to do that. But you, no matter the trials on this earth, Though the walls may be tumbling down around you, you still have that red little scarlet cord in your window, and that ain't going anywhere. You will not face the wrath of God. You will not know wrath. The whole world's going to bring troubles. You will not know wrath. This flesh will fail us. You will not know wrath. You may face the wrath of man. Somebody might even put an angry face on one of your Facebook posts. But you will not face the arge of God, the wrath, the violent, passionate, justifiable, and righteous abhorrence against sin. You're not going to face it because Christ knew it for you through Christ. You have been saved from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. You walk in his life. 
1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 56. The cross changes the believer's view of death. No matter your walk, no matter your last name, no matter your standing on this earth, there will be a day where you'll be face to face with the cross of Jesus Christ. It will either be that you face it and that will be your tomb, or you will face it and that will be your eternity in grace, in peace, in majesty, in thanksgiving with your Savior. 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 56. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our traditional practices. No? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. You can't do it without him. I don't know how you'd lay your head on the pillow at night if you don't know the Lord and know that everything is in his hands. Assurance, your assurance is rooted in peace, and you should rest assured in the death, burial, and resurrection of your Savior. He's got you. And you're not called to walk a perfect life on this earth. They killed the Savior. The world's not going to let you slide. But as the world comes down on you, react to them as God reacted to you in love. You walk out of these doors and you walk into that world, put your arm out, hook up. Think of yourself last. Die to yourself daily. Show them the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for you. You, If you know where you're going, praise God, you know where you're going. It'd be awful tempting to look at that at that curtain being pulled and seeing a stranger not, not knowing if they know the Savior. And if you were sitting in that bed, the thought that should cross your mind is, I know where I'm going. I don't want hell for anyone. We are saved by his life. Rest assured in Jesus Christ. So what more could you ask for? What more could you ask for? To the Messianic Jews who wanted to bring in their traditions and shackle people again to the law, was his son not enough? Was the blood of the Almighty himself not enough? You need something else. You need to still maintain your control over your circumstance. You, need, you still need your family and friends. You still need your job. You still need this money in order to make Jesus worth it. Is his son not enough? And to the extremists on the other end, this son of God, the only one that died for you, is he not worth following as he says to follow me? He is worth everything. And he gave everything. He sat on the mercy seat so you could sit here on this day and hear the word of the Lord. One sprinkle would do it. He poured out his blood so that your cup would overflow. And as your cup overflows, it should splash on those around you. They should see the blood that was shed for you. Not disunity. Not lack of fellowship. And what are we to do? What are we to do with this God? What are we to do with this Savior that we have? God gives us an imperative in his word through Paul to go to those people back then to where culturally, da 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 He's given this word right here for you. Listen, what are you to do with this Christ? More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. That is a command. Rejoice is a command. Exalt in God. Boast in God. Do not boast in yourself because that's like an open grave. When we speak of ourselves, instead of the sweet-smelling aroma of Jesus Christ that we should be lifting up, is that it's, it's as if we are walking over into a grave, opening a coffin and say, smell that. Boast in yourself and you will lead people to follow you. And that's the blind leading the blind. Speak 
life. Boast in God. And he will point people to the only one that can save them. Rejoice with others that we are alive. That God made you alive. He brought you from the grave here now through his own son. He took your place on that cross. By his stripes, we are healed. By his love, we know love. By him, through him, to him, be glory, honor, and praise forever. Tell somebody about him. Anybody. Tell yourself about him every morning when you're standing in front of a mirror or you're driving down the road and somebody cuts you off. Preach the gospel to yourself every day. Charles Simeon, an 1800s pastor and theologian, says this, If a man has lived in sin for ever so many years and has at last been led with deep repentance and contrition to the foot of the cross, this mercy is instantly granted to him. Neither does the enormity of a man's transgressions make any difference in this respect. He may have been as vile as ever David was, and yet on coming truly to Christ, his iniquities shall be pardoned. Amen, hallelujah, praise to God. If you're sitting in the seat this, this morning and you don't know Christ as your Savior, and you want to work some things out first, you want to get cleaned up, you ever wash your car before you go to a car wash? doesn't make any sense. Christ is not afraid of your dirt. He faced the dirt of the grave and he defeated it. There is no victory in the grave. There's only victory in Christ Jesus alone. Cry out to him. He knows you from your mother's womb. For those who do believe in the Christ, know that he knitted you in the mother's womb and on that day when he saved you by grace alone, through faith alone, because of his good will alone and his glory alone, he knitted you anew with that scarlet thread. You will forever be in the window of this world and people ought to see that. Not disunity, but unity because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you know him, you exalt in him. If you don't, one drop will do it. One drop of his precious blood. He poured it out. He poured it out so that stone heart would be made flesh again to beat, to not beat with the same blood that kept you in the grave and shackled you to that sin, but by the blood of Jesus Christ, your heart starts to beat and starts to pump. You start to breathe. Your eyes are open. You start to walk. And you open your mouth. Out of that heart, the mouth speaks. Speak Christ. Exalt in him. 